Okay, um, Salam and welcome to the third session of Najir Knowledge Series. My name is Nimrik Balsurti and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, a brief recap of A brief recap uh, of Give Back to Pakistan, uh, Pharmacy in Pakistan. Basically, this group was originated in um, the closure of IVPN 2018 conference. And uh, it is a group run by overseas pharmacists who have an intention to grow their profession and give back to their homeland and uh, establish the same worldwide uh, status of the pharmacy profession that we see uh, in different countries. Uh, as for our first speaker today, uh, Dr. Shweb uh, Mahmood, unfortunately he was not able to join us today. So I would like to invite Dr. Asma Hamid, Manager Pharmacy Services, Dow University Hospital, uh, to share her uh, knowledge with us, uh, the experience that she, she has spent in Aga Khan University Hospital, the 17 years that she has given there, and the diversified knowledge that she has uh, gained from there. So ma'am, uh, over to you. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me, please? Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Yes, Balkan Islam, we can hear you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and hope you are doing well. Uh, before going to my uh, topic of today, I would like to first thank to GBTTP, uh, TPP organizing committee, especially Bigisab, for giving me an opportunity to give some talk on this platform. So uh, let's just start with the topic, but, but before going to topic, I would like to express my uh, feelings. That's why I choose this topic as today for the presentation, that is safe handling of hazardous drugs. Uh, I had a great experience in my previous organization work as a supervisor oncology, IV style preparation area and non style preparation area, where I had a good experience and I learned a lot and I was uh, pretty involved in the safe handling of these hazardous drugs. When I choose topic, I want to brief you, give you a brief introduction within a limited time of 10 minutes, but uh, I want to share this uh, because uh, I had encountered some uh, hazardous drugs interaction with my own experience. Uh, before coming to the topic, uh, the formal presentation, uh, is topic ka essence yoga ye hoga ki hum safe handling of hazardous drug kis tarike se deal kar rahe hain. Uske baad hum hamare pas kya strategies honi chahiye. Wo cheez hai jo shayad I'm sure ki majority of you are not aware because majority of you are working in a community pharmacy setters and and I think a few of you have some interaction with the uh, safe uh, hazardous drugs or dealing with the hazardous drug, especially in cytotoxic cleaning. Now coming to my topic, first I would disclose that I have no conflict of interest with regard to this presentation. The background and the objective is to just uh, sharing knowledge uh, with you, especially pharmacists on this platform. Learning objectives, you will have some knowledge after this uh, small presentation and you have some insight uh, what are hazardous drugs and how to deal with these drugs in a safe manner. So why we need? Uh, there are reported over 8, 8 million healthcare workers were exposed to hazardous drugs every year. This was reported by the CDC and around more than 50 studies confirmed the traces of hazardous drug in a urine samples of healthcare workers and that had that indicated that they had actual exposure to hazardous drug and uh, simultaneously the rising burden of the disease of cancer throughout the world that WHO reported already 
and uh, over the next decades it would be it for the quantum would be double so we need to know that why hazardous drug interaction with the hazardous drug is also may cause contribute to can, uh, causing a cancer disease these are some standards and guidelines on hazardous drugs and i'm sure you are pretty much aware of these uh, standard guidelines except few american society of health system pharmacists set some guidelines on the handling of hazardous drugs similar to international society of oncology pharmacy practitioners uh, maintain on the use of the handling of hazardous drug osha is another organization that is occupational safety and health administration though this is not uh, directly linked to the healthcare uh, organization but it has also a uh, certain uh, controlling occupational exposure to hazardous drug uh, uh, list available we all are very aware of usp 800 this is the new version of usp 797 previous usp 797 was focused on protecting israel products but the new version to more focused on the protecting people especially healthcare workers and patients whom healthcare workers include pharmacists pharmacy technician nursing and even physician who are directly or indirectly involved in the uh, dealing of these hazardous drugs then we have neosh national institute of occupational safety and health program that established uh, a list of antineoplastic and other hazardous drugs in the year 2016 so these are the standards and guidelines available on the use of hazardous drugs and the safe use of the hazardous drugs So by definition, NIOSH define hazardous drugs are those drugs that may contribute carcinogenic, teratogenic, or any other development toxicity. Some may uh, cause reproductive toxicity, including uh, miscarriages, fetal abnormality, threaten abortion. Some uh, uh, person experience organ toxicity even at low doses. and some may experience genotoxicity and structure and toxicity profile of new drug that may make existing drug determined hazardous by the above criteria so these are the basically uh, the causative factor that may contribute these drugs under the category of hazardous drug so uh, healthcare workers who are directly exposed to these uh, hazardous drug may have developed carcinogenic or reproductive toxicity especially especially those females who are pregnant or having lactation may develop these uh, hazards now the type of hazardous drugs newest divide uh, hazardous drugs into three major groups first of all antineoplastic drugs so you are well aware the list of antineoplastics there are three examples uh, i have mentioned anestrozole bendamustine and ansetabine then we have a list of non antineoplastic drugs that meet one or more neosh criteria for hazardous drug they may include some antiviral abacavir uh, antiepileptic dalprex estradiol is hormone estrogen and spironolactone and the third type is drug drug that primarily poses a reproductive risk to man and women who are actively trying to conceive or women who are pregnant or having lactation examples are clomiphen clonazepam due to stride and first and fda have already mentioned the black box working on these uh, the package of the, uh, these products so these are the basically the three types of uh, hazardous drug that may can can contribute uh, towards the uh, nephro oh, sorry teratogenicity or reproductive toxicity etc this slide just showing that example of new defined antineoplastic drugs uh, used in healthcare settings and here you can see anti some antineoplastic drugs are mentioned and non antineoplastic drugs include as a as a thiopurine and mycophenolate uh, and all comes in fda pregnancy uh, category x or category d so they are uh, there are special warnings mentioned on the these uh, medicines even the oral medicines when the they were used uh, they should not be crushed or it should not be open in a an open environment so we may have to have some uh, precautionary uh, 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 precautionary things to maintain the uh, risk uh, to uh, uh, maintain the risk factor minimized level now we have a new hazardous drug list here you can see we have two links provided on this slide first is the list 2016 new Uh, that is available on this link and you can see what type of drugs are defined as hazardous drugs 
The second uh, link is related to the list that is upcoming in 2020 and it's still under review. And this is all uh, surprisingly it's open to public for review. You can easily uh, visit to this link uh, for your any input. If you have experienced any uh, major side effects related to this uh, hazardous risk, you can report uh, that side effect to this link and they will uh, definitely evaluate the, those side effects on the basis of the hazard associated with the use of that drug they will incorporate that drug in the hazardous drug list. Uh, some drugs that other than antineoplastic proposed to be added in this 2020 list include metifosin, avabaradin, isotretinoin, and clobazin. So you can imagine, uh, though we think these drugs are not hazardous, but these drugs, handling of these drugs may contribute any uh, lethal or uh, health impact on the uh, person who is dealing with these medications. Now handling of hazardous drug. We know uh, we need to provide some individualized medicine through compounding uh, and compounding plays a vital role for uh, meeting the patient unique need, medical need. So we have to, must have to have some guidelines for the protection of pharmacy workers who are directly or indirectly involved in the compounding of non strand and strand preparation. So in general, the guidelines recommend the use of engineering controls. So what are engineering controls? What do you think? Oh, engineering controls sponsor which I can. Definitely, we must have to have certain uh, ISO class 5 environment. Uh, we need to have some biological safety cabinets, negative pressure area, air changes per hour, or partial differential, humidity control, whatever. These sub things that you have to use in USP 800, we will build engineering controls. I would not go in detail. So, just to give you a refresh that engineering controls is a mandatory requirement for handling these hazardous drugs. Second thing is the administrative control. We must have to have some SOPs and policies. If we have a plan policies, we know everybody must have a knowledge that how to deal, how to manage, and how to prepare and how to dispense. So SOPs and uh, policy procedures are a mandatory requirement and administrative control means the area must have some buffer room, uh, negative pressure room, storage area, garbing room, uh, changeover, downing and running room, doffing, everything. So we need to have some administrative control for handling these uh, hazardous drugs. Work practice control include the uh, SOPs, procedures, and uh, guidelines, how to deal with these drugs, how to uh, man manage the spill, and uh, if the spill or leakage occurs, uh, who is responsible, to whom we report, and uh, is there any spill kit available in the environment, and the use of PP. That's very important, the protective gears, what protective gear must want uh, before coming to that area, and how to uh, dispose that uh, personal protective equipment after the use of hazardous drug. Uh, this is a list of PPs like gloves, gowns, and face mask, shoe cover, uh, and even sometimes we use respirator. And the fourth thing is very important, that is employee training program. I must assure that once we deal with the hazardous drug, it's mandatory to have, must have some knowledge of training, hands-on experience. My good experience is that we are from the organization, start through my training, start uh, inception of my training, so there is a proper mechanism that when you are going to a specialized setting where you are dealing with the cytotoxic agents or hazardous drugs, so you must have some knowledge of these products. Uh, employee training program incorporated in a bazooka. If we are working with the hazardous drug, we must have knowledge of the drug. Even not only pharmacists, the pharmacy technician we involved in is working with, they must have some knowledge of the employee training program. Or usme aapko jo hai wo risk or spills or everything should not be. These may have contribute to reduce occupational exposure to hazardous drug. Now I'll go through with the each step of uh, USP mentioned, uh, USP 800 mentioned for uh, dealing with these hazardous drugs like at the time of receiving and unpacking when receiving antineoplastic hazardous drug or active API, uh, we must unpack uh, maybe in a neutral, normal, or negative pressure, depending upon the nature of the product. It is crucial that personal protective equipment, I had already mentioned, sometimes we must uh, want double gloving, so there is a need of, uh, depending upon the product. According to NEOSH, receiving and packing storage for all types of hazardous drugs do not require gloves, but are recommended. Uh, 
And similarly, in your sister, the disparity protection is only required when the spills or leaks occur. So there is no disparity protection required in usual environment, but when it spills, we are leaks. So we have uh, special precautions there. The second step is storage. Storage is very mandatory step. Uh, especially we need to identify drop packages, bins, shelves, or storage area for LG. And uh, the proper labeling, ho, identify, identification, ho, special handling precautions, ho, written procedures to find out. Or these should be stored separately from other stock uh, to minimize the risk of uh, contamination or personal exposure. Uh, list of drugs uh, covered by uh, hazardous drug policy information on spill and emergency contact procedure should be posted or easily available to every employee who is working in that area. And hazardous should be handled with caution at all times using appropriate chemotherapy gloves during receiving distribution. So, uh, compounding, I and you all understand that once we deal with the dilution, so we must have some certain uh, negative pressure area. Uh, through primary engineering controls, and we must ensure class 2 BS uh, biological safety cabinets type A2, B1, or B2 that are acceptable for compounding hazardous drugs. Some uh, units may have a closed system transfer device. This is new technique, uh, but this is expensive. And some um, organizations are following these CSSTD, but majority of them have not have any facility for CSSTD. Uh, is, is ke lava jo special precautions hai ke aap ne in area mein smoking nahi karni, drinking nahi karni, ko cosmetics or eating wagera yeh ta ke aap is risk ko exposure ko minimize kar sakte. So this should be avoided in these areas. Dispensing medication, uh, that's very important stuff. Uh, first of all, humme uh, apne jo bhi staff humara involved with dispensing usko yeh batana hai ke in case of this uh, spill accidental uh, uh, fall. We have to handle it in a way that we have safety training required. We have to tell you that if you have a liquid hazardous drug or antinuclear plastic transport, or if you have a pneumatic tube facility, that should be avoided. Because there is a risk of contamination. Dr. Rajan, do you have one to two minutes more? I'll go speedy. Sure. Coming to administration, uh, though pharmacists are not directly involved, but nursing are involved, but uh, yeah, USP 800 states that nurses has to trash tablets and special plastic balls should use exposure. I already discussed the use of EP and uh, training of the cleanup spills, so I'm skipping this. This is the most important slide for me. Medical screening and surveillance, surveillance plan for hazardous drug handle. Uh, first of all, we need to have uh, the knowledge that who, uh, what are the group of employees who are potentially exposed? Uh, it's really important that before uh, placement of these staff, we, they must have some hands-on experience and training program. They have some uh, health screening before job placement. It's a periodic health appraisal in between in between and at least minimum annually. You can see that they have health screening, physical examination, reproductive health, chest x-ray, urine samples. So that they can minimize the risk of this. And besides that, we have to see work-related health changes. After placement, we don't have any such thing that is related to the risk associated with the risk associated. This is very important. And I think that many organizations lack it. I was in my previous organization, I approached my employee health program and we had contacted them that you can do it, this is the mandatory and OSHA guidelines also support them. So this is very important. We have not only followed SOPs, but we have to address their employees' screening and their health issues. Now I'm skipping this question, though this is related to NIOSH guidelines and just I want to finish my presentation with this case study, where a 39-year-old pharmacist suffered two episodes of painless hematuria and was found to have cancer, a grade two. Uh, 12 years before she, her diagnosis, she had worked full-time for 20 months in a hospital IV preparation area where she routinely prepared cytotoxic agent. Or as well as good cytotoxic preparation use kar rahi thi, pe wo horizontal laminar flow hood use kar rahi thi that directed the air flow toward her. Because she was a non-smoker and had no other known operational environmental risk factors, her cancer was attributed to her antineoplastic drug exposure at work. Any idea? Participants can answer this case study. What's the causative factor for developing cancer? 
okay i am disclosing uh, they haven't any listed antineoplastic drugs use of horizontal laminar flow hood was the contributing factor because she was uh, preparing cytotoxic preparation and she was not following safe handling standards for hazardous drug so i would conclude my presentation with the note सेफ हैंडलिंग ऑफ ड्रग्स में सिर्फ आपने एस ओ पीज नहीं बनाने प्रोसीजर गाइडलाइंस नहीं देनी है बल्कि उसके अलावा भी आपने अपने इम्प्लॉय की हेल्थ और सेफ्टी को इंश्योर करने के लिए उनकी प्रॉपर स्क्रीनिंग और सर्विस प्रोग्राम को भी इंकॉपरेट करना है एट योर लेवल थैंक यू सो मच Uh, thank you, Dr. Asma, for sharing such knowledge with us. Um, there are some questions from our peers that I will be sharing with you. Uh, one of the question is from me: is that um, do we have to get uh, regular blood work done for pharmacists or technicians? It's like a early basis, or um, what would be the periodic time for that test? I really don't know. In fact, the established organizations haven't this uh, sort of. maybe some organization are following out of uh, pakistan within pakistan i have not any information uh, but we need to develop some periodic checkup plans like physical examination urine sampling blood work up uh, at least annually or we have to switch these staff uh, through shifting periodic shifting uh, because to minimize the risk of exposure okay uh, okay there is a question from mr mock Uh, he says that um, can you share some little bit about national local hazardous drug disposal guidelines national or local local whatever guidelines do we have about uh, hazardous drugs disposal no uh, i haven't any information i think there is no national hazardous uh, drug disposal guidelines but we have international guidelines how to dispose of uh, the waste of these uh, hazardous drugs and how we can minimize the risk of exposure to environment and the uh, the person who personally who is involved in the hazardous drug preparation and wasting so i went in from shaidi robin think that there is a national program for this or that things okay and um, i'm dr umar bhutta wants to ask that uh, do we have to have negative pressure for storage of hazardous drugs or uh, yes we need to um, stock these products in a negative pressure area but uh, somehow uh, since these are packaged properly appropriately and majority of them are in a glass container so we can stock them in a even positive pressure area but uh, if we have a good space within inside the negative pressure room so we, we uh, it's preferable to stock these drugs in a negative pressure room you know order to avoid the minimum contamination Okay uh thank you so much ma'am for your time and for your knowledge and sharing with us um i would like to invite our next presenter uh mr azam ishaq he is a hospital pharmacist at sheikh khalifa medical city abu dhabi uae he graduated from university of punjab college of pharmacy in october 2009 with a doctor of pharmacy degree and has experience in drug information training from shaka khan memorial center and research center lahore he is a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist and certified medication therapy management pharmacist and he is a primary preceptor in pgy1 pharmacy residency program at scha and um, he trained residents in medication therapy management uh, thank you so much sir, for being here with us today sir I would like to hand over the board to you, please. So you can, um, Dr. Arjun, can you see the screen now? Yeah, that's fine now. So please start. All right. Uh, I'm sorry for this delay, and assalamualaikum to everyone. Uh, well, it's first time here. thank you it's first time with this um, giving uh, back in to pharmacy in pakistan this group and um, uh, without de uh, delaying anything and without any disclosure i just start my presentation um yeah i'll go directly to the learning objectives um actually uh today i will share this ue local guidelines which were created by our covid team and it is from saha based mostly and 
but we have um, collaboration from uh, Dubai and also Abu Dhabi DOH group. And most of the team was from SKMC. Um, the, the guideline we started, it was like, I will give you the learning objective of this presentation. I would try to um, explain the clinical management of COVID-19 infection. And then we'll describe the practice steps to deal with the COVID cases and identify the role of clinical pharmacists in dealing COVID-19 patients. So here is a, a small question. If uh, like uh, I can read out, patient is started with hydroxychloroquine because he was a positive case with low, low to moderate risk of pneumonia. And what are the parameters we should monitor with this therapy? So if uh, you'd like to go for the answers, we can discuss at the end. The next slide is about the summary of the national guidelines. Um, I just want to give you a glimpse as we are the COVID center in Abu Dhabi. So we are just making the guidelines and also reviewing it. Like, uh, are we going fine with the patients with these guidelines or do we need to change something? The biggest change which I would like to mention is number three, which is the treatment of asymptomatic patients. And we change it from asymptomatic to the high risk patient. Whether it is positive or not, they have the symptoms, or if they don't have the symptom, we based on the high risk. What is the high risk criteria? We can uh, discuss later. I will tell you what is, what is that criteria. So our focus will be on the uh, management of these cases. So according to these guidelines, what we want to tell you about when the patient comes in the hospital, there is case management. Depending upon the, uh, like the patient is positive and all the workout about the sign and symptoms, we, we run a short uh, bio biochemistry tests for them so that we can see like in which category we can place them, the, chemi uh, the chemistry and hematology which there is an order set for that, which based on C CBC, uh, renal profile, serum glucose, and there is LFTs, there are biomarkers, inflammatory biomarkers, especially CRP, procalcitonin, and because the patient, we will start on hydroxychloroquine, so we, are, we have to go for G6PD. Uh, apart from this, we go for this D-dimer, because there is a link with this disease, and TROPS, for the cardio patient because this affect all this medic, uh, disease also affect the cardio uh, cardiac uh, pathophysiology and also hiv uh, antigen antibody and pregnancy test which is also very important because of this family then uh, there was a, a small basic test which we run and when the patient is positive we also go for a few other things with the microbiology with radiology and especially in cardiac investigation, which we have for ECG, uh, uh, TROPS, and also pro BNP. Once the case is managed and we see like the, in the patient is positive and in which uh, category we have placed the patient, uh, depending upon the high risk factor. So what are the high risk factor of this patient? Like if the patient is more than 55, and they have pre-existing pulmonary disease or uh, chronic kidney disease. If the, their diabetes is un, unmanaged, they are having uncontrolled hypertension. Apart from this, about the vitals, like the respiratory rate is more than 24, heart rate is more than 125 beats per minute, or they have lab di uh, disarrangement. Uh, for example, D-dimer is more than 1,000 or CPK, and CRP, LDH, we, we all follow. After this, we decided patient is at high risk or not. So once we decided like the patient is positive and it is, uh, we categorize them like it is low risk, medium risk, high risk. So directly I will jump towards the uh, pharmacotherapy plan of these patients. So what we decide, like if the patient is confirmed and they are asymptomatic, usually we will not treat them until unless they have the high risk, which we have discussed. 
So we'll just monitor them and we will make a plan to uh, discharge these patients. Once the patient is confirmed case of COVID-19, but they are without pneumonia. So our therapeutic options are hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine and uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, which we can choose any one of them. And these updated guidelines, we change the duration, frequency of these medication. The combinations are same. Till we reach uh, the confirmed cases who are very at high risk and they have pneumonia. So our next category would be confirmed cases of COVID-19 who have pneumonia, confirmed, and how we confirm from the radiology and the other biomarkers, like which we have discussed in uh, inflammatory markers. So there our therapy choices changed. Rather to go for the single agent, like hydroxychloroquine or chloro chloroquine or lopinavir, ritonavir, or favipiravir, we make a combination. And that combination depends on hydroxychloroquine or favipiravir. But before uh, going this, there are some parameters which we uh, should go through, like uh, the minimum criteria to start this medication, because we have to monitor something like, for these medication which we, I discussed, we go for CBC, renal profile, hepatic profile, and serum lights, and blood glucose, because these medication affect these things. So once the patient is confirmed and he is at high risk and he has pneumonia, our choices expands and we go for hydroxychloroquine. That is our first choice with favipiravir. Second choice is uh, one more thing about favipiravir. When we started these, uh, formulated these guidelines, what we did, favipiravir was started on 1600 milligram BID as a loading dose. And then what we did, we started 600 TID for 10 to 14 days. Then we analyzed and compared with those patients to whom the loading dose was same, but the maintenance dose was 600 BID. So there was uh, not a significant difference. So that was the major change in our new updated guidelines. So now Favipiravir is 600 milligram BID as maintenance dose. And about uh, lopinavir and ritonavir or hydroxychloroquine, once we choose this combination, our uh, strategy for monitoring uh, changed a little bit. And in that case, for example, if the patient is getting worse, we can uh, switch the therapy from these uh, combination to remdesivir. Uh, as far as I know, there are only few cases to whom we started remdesivir who were not properly, I mean, responding to this, uh, this therapy. So once we have the confirmed cases, but he is very severe, he has very severe pneumonia. Uh, when we go for CT of these patients, chest CT, they, we have a risk criteria and that will tell us like patient is, has mild pneumonia, moderate or high. If the patient is having high pneumonia and he's high risk patient and he's critically ill, then most probably we directly go to remdesivir. But as you know, before going to remdesivir, we have to run a lot of uh, blood tests and um, there are many parameters which we have to fulfill, like IL-6, and uh, uh, that should be like uh, more than 100 to start this therapy. And then there are different monitoring parameters. Um, go to the next slide. The protocol for the uh, uh, practical steps. Um, as I mentioned, there are laboratory radi radiological uh, monitoring of these patients, which pharmacists, as clinical, ph clinical pharmacists, uh, they are doing it and they are the part of this COVID-19 team. And they have to go through each, each of these monitoring parameters. Then we come uh, to the ECG where QT interval is very important for this patient and other biomarkers. Uh, 
Um, uh, there are a lot of things which I want to mention, but just because of this time, I would skip these things and I will go to the case, like the case I have, the interactive patient case. Uh, <clears throat> there was a patient, and this is a real case. He was 37 year old and previously healthy, but uh, he was tested positive with COVID-19. Uh, his past medical history was a uh, major depressive disorder for which he was taking olanzapine 5 mg uh, once and clonazip uh, clonazepam 1 mg BID. Then the COVID team, uh, they started on this, uh, the first protocol, like he was positive and moderate risk for pneumonia. So they started the therapy after uh, running the monitoring panel, which I have already discussed. So they decided to start hydroxychloroquine as loading dose and then maintenance dose and favipiravir loading dose and maintenance dose. His serum was 3.3 millimole. And when ECG monitor showed, showed us like QT interval is 450 uh, and LFTs are more point of 1.5 times, uh, they are deranged. So being a, cl a clinical pharmacist, like what should be our step in this, in this case? Uh, I, so what I did, we, our team did, we gave them the, we run the report, uh, I mean the tests like ECG and uh, CBC, serum lights, LFTs, RFTs. So once we confirmed like uh, they are okay, but these, readings, they are quite disturbed. Loading dose was given. And after 24 hours, we have option to run ECG monitoring again. So once, uh, and if we did the notes, and once we uh, noticed that, that like uh, ECG showed us like QT interval prolonged to 600. So we were worried. And um, our team decided like, in this case, we have to stop this medication. We, we saw there was, there was no other medication which can prolong QT pro, uh, interval, but the patient was not like stable. So uh, hydroxychloroquine was immediately stopped and olanzapine, it was also stopped because that was one of the reason he was using at home, but here it was stopped. And um, the patient was switched to only favipiravir and then we decided like if uh, uh, the IL-6 it goes more than 100 then remdesivir uh, we can start or um, but what happened next day uh, when we stopped hydroxychloroquine and olanzapine was already stopped the patient uh, QT uh, ECG showed normal, like it was 460. And the patient was uh, continued on favipiravir as 600 BID. Uh, then we kept a check on this um, uh, uric acid level. It was increasing, but still it was upper limit. And uh, we, we suggested them to stay on the same therapy. Uh, these all the references which uh, uh, national guidelines we took it from there and that's it if you have any question sir there is a question by uh, mr haris mazur is iv corticosteroids under consideration for managing covid-19 patients Actually, it is not in our consideration until unless we have a special case for that. It, it is actually case to case based, but that is not our first uh, for priority for that. Um, sir, I have a question. I actually have two sure. questions. Uh, one of them is that uh, what are the significant biomarkers uh, which decide that we change or switch to combination therapy? And secondly, um, how is the impact of toxizumab on patients with COVID-19? Because we have seen a trend in Pakistan that uh, toxizumab is being targeted as the COVID-19 uh, treatment protocol here. Yes, exactly. Actually, uh, about uh, the monitoring panel, which you discussed, like 
which medication we are dealing with what if it is hydroxychloroquine um then the first thing is like uh, we go for g6pd for this patient they should be negative but actually it is uh, according to me it's something like a false which reading we we are using here uh because there are four types of g6pd and usually our community it does not fall in that category we are in the four or three even is the in these patient if we use hydroxychloroquine that's not a big deal okay. uh, apart from this we have to uh, monitor ecg because uh, these patient uh, this is qt prolongation medication along with that serum uh, electrolytes which is very important especially potassium and magnesium potassium we have to keep uh, keep uh, more than 4 millimole per liter and magnesium okay. round one and about uh, uh, to see, uh, what what is your second question please so second question was oh, um, there was one about corticosteroids that um, can they be under consideration for covid-19 patients and uh, the other question was toxicizumab Toxicizumab, Actremra. It's like the targeted uh, treatment that is being used in Pakistan at many different institutions for COVID nineteen. So, what is your input for that, or the uh, international input on that? Actually, we are using only for those patients who are a high risk and they have pneumonia, and the pneumonia is like from the CT we can see it is severe. and they are not responding to the other standard therapy which we have decided in uh, uae then according to some parameters which i discussed like uh, their serum il should be more than uh, 100 their ferritin should be more these are all biomarkers and ldh should be uh, more than 250 or 300 and d dimer that is very important for this uh, it should be more than 1 and crp since the patient is fitting in this criteria then we can uh, start this uh, tocilizumab okay and uh, so there is a question by abid jamil he is asking um, what is the criteria for reuse of n95 mask and uh, what is the difference between um, n95 and k95 kn95 mask for different materials right uh for n95 mask uh, there are different things like uh, according to our guidelines they say you can reuse it depending okay. upon which uh, area and which patient you are serving because we have different isolation wards uh, with negative pressure with normal pressure so if it is with the the patient who are in isolation room with normal pressure there they it is suggested you can reuse it but with the patient with negative pressure and depending upon the supply they say don't reuse it okay so it's like different guidelines uh, according yeah, different to guidelines. the environment where we are yeah it's like uh, hit and trial so still nothing is confirmed the thing which are today maybe tomorrow they will be changed so it's uh, So there are actually uh, three more questions, but I'll sure, sure. pick two uh, because mm -hmm. of the limitation of time. So there is mm -hmm. a question that when do you start treatment for COVID nineteen? Immediately after first positive result, or wait for confirmation result from other sources? Uh, actually, as I defined, like uh, we have prioritized on the case management, we have prioritized like in which category we will place the patient. though it is positive then we will see like what are the other risk factors if they are positive asymptomatic we will not treat them if they are positive symptomatic but their ct shows us like they don't have pneumonia we will start the therapy immediately but with single therapy with single medication either which of them suits to the patient but once uh, the patient is getting worse our therapy options getting changed from single option to the combination and as the disease goes severe our therapeutic option getting changed till we reach uh, tocilizumab or remdesivir whatever 
Okay, um, so there is a question, ending question. There are two ending questions, basically. In case of pregnant patient, any specific consideration? Particularly, if we talk about uh, feviparavir, that's the black box warning for them. This is our first thing. Actually, uh, because of this, uh, what happened with this Zoom, because I'm doing first time, uh, it was messed up. I wanted to di discuss this thing. This was the first thing with feviparavir. Pregnant women... No, we cannot start. Okay. And no. hydroxychloroquine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Hydroxychloroquine. Uh, hydroxychloroquine. We can. Uh, it again depends. Like when we were in the school, we were told like don't use it. But it's not like that. We can use if the. Uh, it depends upon like what is the present situation of the patient. Depending upon that, we can start it. That's not a big deal. But feviparavir, no. Femper is like contraindicated in pregnant females. That's that, uh, absolutely contraindicated. Con contraindicated. Okay. Yeah. Um, and sir, uh, and ending, I will be ending this um, presentation with this question. There are uh, targeted treatments with IVIG as well. Uh, IVIG is being used in COVID-19 mm. patients. So what is the basic role of uh, using IVIG there? Is just for the sepsis or is there any purpose other than for the passive immunity or something else? Uh, it was out of our guideline, you can say, because uh, at the start, we uh, started in some patients, but what we saw, like, there was no benefit. Rather, we were making the things worse. Okay. And, um, you know, before starting, you have to run a lot of panel, and there is a lot of monitoring for that. And there was no uh, defined mechanism, like how it is working and what are the benefits we are getting, the, which the things which are documented internationally, we couldn't mm -hmm. find in our patients. So that is not our option. Okay. Until unless we don't have anything. Thank you so much, sir, for clarifying a lot of our uh, uh, concepts for COVID-19 treatment and our pharmacist role in the COVID-19 and what uh, targeted therapies we should be using and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I'll be closing no, this okay. presentation with uh, this uh, announcement that in the coming week we'll be having Dr. Zahiruddin Barber with us. Uh, he will be presenting on how to publish your work and this uh, session will be conducted on May 13th 13th at 10 p.m. Pakistan time. Thank you all for being with us here and uh, um, gaining knowledge as we stand here today. Thank you.